Welcome back to CapTech. As you know, our channel is very eclectic, covering topics from video game reviews, a uh, fair amount of what I'd loosely deem as comedy. Uh, well, today, we're going to take a darker turn into the true crime genre. If your head's been in the sand as of late when it comes to bad news these days, I really can't blame you. But with stories like this one coming to light recently about serial killers and yeah, in the LaSalle County, uh, Illinois Valley area, it seems like it might be time for a deeper dive into true crime um, around the greater area of Ottawa, Illinois. On August 26, Florida profiler Phil Chalmers released an episode of his podcast entitled Where the Bodies Are Buried, in which he interviewed 61-year-old convicted serial killer Delmas Colvin. In the interview, Colvin revealed he met a woman at a truck stop in LaSalle whom he murdered and left naked behind an old truck wash. Now you may already be aware that not too many years back, authorities found some burnt bodies in the Dayton area, just north of Ottawa. And while this murder happened to be solved pretty quickly, um, something in this heinous and gruesome uh, happening in our neck of the woods compelled me to dive even deeper into this dark and at times even macabre uh, local history here. So let's start with the most notorious Glorious case in the history of the area, the Starved Rock Murders. On March 14, 1960, the bodies of three women from the Chicago suburbs were discovered in St. Louis Canyon in Starved Rock, one of the many uh, natural wonders uh, near Utica, Illinois. Uh, the crime shocked all of northern Illinois and led to a manhunt that snared a confessed killer. It is one of the most shocking stories to ever occur in this area. While the case is considered solved, there have been uh, some doubts raised. Although no convincing evidence presented says that Chester Weger, who was convicted, didn't do it, but ironically, no one can say that Starve Rock does not have a violent and bloody past even before this, as the investigation of the Starve Rock murders slowly moved forward. Fear gripped our entire region. Doors that were never locked before were suddenly now firmly secured. Hardware stores experienced a run on deadbolts, and sporting goods stores saw guns vanish from their cases at a staggering and alarming rate. The number of overnight guests at Starve Rock Lodge dropped off to almost nothing, and some motorists went miles out of their way to avoid driving near the canyon entrance. Newspapers and radio across the state widely reported upon the slow progress of the investigation, which elevated the level of panic in the area. LaSalle County State's Attorney Harlan Warren, a hardworking and respected public official, was technically in charge, but the state police maintained their authority in the case because the murders were committed on park property. Two law enforcement camps often clashed, but Warren was in a bind as he was forced to deal with the state authorities because the officials in LaSalle County lacked experience dealing with crimes of this manner. Using his own money, Warren eventually purchased a microscope and began intently conducting a study on the twine used in the murders. Faced with the fact that all of the lodge employees had been given polygraph tests, 
and had passed, Warren now had to wonder if the tests had been accurate, so he decided that it was time to run some of his own tests. Warren recalled all of the employees who had worked during the week of the murder. One by one, they came to a small cabin located near the lodge and again submitted to the polygraph exam. The first dozen or so were quickly cleared, and Warren and the deputies wondered if they might be wasting their time. Then they brought in a former dishwasher named Chester Otto Weger, and everything changed. When Weger's polygraph test was completed, Warren noticed that the examiner's face had gone pale. As soon as Weger left the cabin, the technician ended months of endless leads and wasted time when he turned to Warren and his two hand-picked deputies and quietly asserted, that's your man. But Weger, 21, was a slight small man with a wife and two young children. He had worked at the park until that summer when he resigned to go into business with his father as a house painter. Police remembered the man's name from an earlier police report, but he had never made much of an impression on the investigators. Warren intensified the investigation of the man, and strangely, Weger happily cooperated with him. He surrendered a piece of buckskin jacket that he owned so that um, some suspicious dark stains on it could be examined. It later proved to be human blood, but in, in 1960, it could not yet be typed and matched to a specific victim. Warren also asked Weger to submit to further polygraph tests, and again, Weger agreed. He was then given an entire series of tests, and he failed them. A new problem reared its head. With all the crime and energy involved in the investigation, Warren had worked very little on his campaign for re-election. If he booked Weger on rape and murder charges before the election, attorneys would say he had done so as a stunt to retain his job. So he left Uyghur under surveillance, not wanting to jeopardize the case against him with the election, was confident of his record of cleaning up gambling and prostitution out of LaSalle County during his eight previous years in office. For more of this, watch our video on Kelly and Collie and the history of organized crime. Warren let his past actions speak for themselves, but his opponent let the bungling of the Starve Rock murder case speak for him. Out of 60,000 votes cast in the election, Warren lost by nearly 3,500. Although he was disappointed by the election results, Warren still had time in office to pursue the case against Uyghur. Though his evidence was not as strong as he would have liked, he was able to obtain an arrest warrant. He believed that when he saw all of the evidence mounting against him, Uyghur would confess to the crime to the Starve Rock murders. The confession was transcribed and signed by Uyghur. During the confession, when he was asked why he had dragged the bodies under an overhang in St. Louis Canyon, Uyghur said that he had spotted a small airplane flying low over the park. Uyghur then stated that he was afraid that it was a state police plane and confessed several more times to the murders over the next few days and reenacted the killing for a crowd of policemen and reporters at the canyon. Then suddenly, after his initial meeting with the court-appointed attorney, Uyghur changed his story and stated that he was innocent of all the charges, that he had been coerced into his confession by authorities threatening him with a gun. He stated that he had lied in his earlier confession and had been so scared that he signed the papers anyway. Chester Uyghur was incarcerated at the Statesville Prison in Joliet. He has been denied parole nearly two dozen times since 1972, and most feel that he belongs securely behind bars. However, in the minds of some people, there are questions uh, about the case that remain unanswered to this very day. Many feel that the evidence that was used to convict Uyghur would not stand up in court today. His prosecution largely turned out to be based on his confession, which predated the Miranda warnings from Miranda v. Arizona that are uh, now required today. Others question 
how a small, slight man like Uyghur could have overpowered three middle-aged women and then moved their bodies by himself to leave them hidden under a rock overhang. Others who believe in uh, Uyghur's innocence point to a deathbed confession that allegedly occurred in 1982 or 83. A Chicago police sergeant named Mark Gibson submitted an affidavit in 2006 recounted this confession. It was being used in court to support a motion for new DNA tests in the Starve Rock murder case. In the affidavit, Gibson stated that he and his police partner, now since deceased, were called in to rush St. Luke's Presbyterian Hospital to see a terminally ill patient who wanted to, quote, clear her conscience. The affidavit proclaimed that the woman was lying in a hospital bed. She indicated that when she was younger, she had been with her friends at a state park when something happened. Then the woman told Sergeant Gibson that she was at a park in Utica and things got, quote, out of hand. Multiple victims were killed and, quote, they dragged the bodies. Gibson said that the woman's daughters then cut the interview short, shouting that their mother was out of her mind and ordered the police from the room. The alleged confession was not allowed into the court hearings, although new DNA tests were ordered. However, they failed to clear Uyghur of anything because the samples had been corrupted over the years. After the attempts for release failed, a clemency petition was sent to Governor Rob Blagojevich, better known as Blago, but it was denied in June 2007. To this day, Chester Uyghur continues to maintain that he was framed for the murders. However, in November 2019, after 24 tries, Chester Uyghur was actually granted parole and has since been released from prison into a halfway house for former convicts. No matter what you may believe about the case, Uyghur confessed. There was evidence connecting him to the crime and he was found guilty in a court of law. But worth noting, some, but not a majority, say he was framed. And while I can't attribute it to the now 80-plus Mr. Uyghur, uh, when he did get released in late 2019, a woman did happen coincidentally to go missing from Starve Rock in early 2020. So this is just a creepy topic once you dive in. Obviously, I'm not saying Uyghur did it, but wow, what a creepy topic. Next, let's look at a couple of cases in the area with a suspect but with no convictions. Shortly after, 32-year-old Tracy Kusick's 2006 drowning, authorities reportedly told the city's newspaper, The Times, formerly known as The Daily Times to those of us over a certain age, that there were no uh, signs of foul play. Then, nothing publicly happened with the case for more than two years, her family said. Flash forward. Dateline 2019, Ottawa, Illinois. A LaSalle County jury found an Ottawa man not guilty of killing his wife from back in 2006. Just a uh, reminder that this is a true story. Kenneth Cusick was accused of drowning his wife Tracy in a toilet bowl, but according to the LaSalle County News Tribune, prosecutors had witnesses testify Tracy could not have drowned accidentally. She overdosed and passed away with her face in the toilet. Her blood did come back positive for methadone, and she was known to use alcohol and drugs. It is interesting to note the timing in this particular case as this trial took place over a decade after Tracy died. Next case. Robert and Marcia Edwards were shot to death January 1st, 1983 in the rural Pontiac home. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office has suspected the couple's adopted son, Joseph Edwards, then 18. He then vanished without a trace despite being featured five times on America's Most Wanted. Anyone with information on the case is asked to call the uh, Livingston County uh, Sheriff's Office. 
little more about Robert and Marcia Edwards' case. Here's how the story goes. With her final gasp of life, Marcia Edwards quickly wrote the name of her killer. Then the squeeze of a trigger left her for dead in her old living room. As her life faded away, she may have heard another blast outside as the gunman shot dead her husband, Robert Edwards. Marcia actually wrote the name of Joe Edwards, who was 18 years young and their adopted son. The investigator's largest tip as to the Slayer's identity, and it remains so almost 30 years later. Joseph Sinat Edwards has been wanted ever since. All this time, the Livingston County Sheriff's Department has been stymied with very few tips and clues. Even after a generational turnover in investigators, the Edwards's murder is still said to cast a shadow in their detective room. The case has never gone away, says Sergeant Earl Dutko, detective. The force has decided to crack open evidence bags sealed from nearly three decades ago. Edwards disappeared without even a trace, but new technology might let police go back and get him and rekindle this hunt via DNA. To that extent, police have new help and have recently found Joe Edwards' birth mother, so scientists will seek to match up her genetics with any markers left at the crime scene, and if it lines up, up a computer trail could possibly lead back to Edwards, you know, especially if he's committed any crimes after that. So this means that an arrest could occur because his dying adoptive mom pointed the finger of guilt his way three decades ago, while his birth mom is now helping to track him down. Not all murders can be explained even as well as this in the Illinois River Valley. And this is by no means only a recent phenomenon. Take, for example, this case from October 2nd, 76. A local farmer in unincorporated Seneca, Illinois, discovers the victim in a ditch along U.S. Route 6, one quarter mile east of the LaSalle County line. The victim had died from a gunshot wound. Artists' renderings depict a female victim. She is said to be African American. At the time of the crime, she would have been 15 to 27 years of age, 5 seven and 150 pounds. If anyone has information, please contact the deputy coroner of uh, Grundy County. Unfortunately, the mysterious murders in the Illinois Valley didn't come to an end with the Carter presidency. On March 26, 2003, seven-year-old Dalton, excuse the last name mispronunciation here, Masharik of Streeter disappeared while waiting outside of his family's home for a church van to pick him up. His body was eventually found the next day at a boat launch on the Vermilion River in rural South Streeter. Police were able to recover a three-pound short-handed sledgehammer that they believe was used in the murder. The hammer, a Bench Pro brand, was sold only at Kmart. Anyone with information on Dalton's murder, hammer used in the murder, or the location where Dalton's body was found, may contact the Illinois State uh, Police, Dalton Masherick Task Force. At one time, there was, and may still be, a $50,000 uh, reward in the case. Members of the community have speculated that a family member uh, was involved, but the mother has said that uh, she had another of her daughters go on the Steve Wilkos show just to squash those particular rumors. She told the reporter that she has an idea who killed Dalton after all these years. The next unsolved murder will examine is the Norway Jane Doe case. I remember this one. I was 16. Dateline, September 13, 1991. Found a woman's body lying face up in the southwest corner of a field one mile south of US 52 and three miles east of Norway, Illinois. Under her was a curtain with the hook still attached. The woman was Caucasian, 
wearing a white men's style dress shirt with vertical light stripes and black and spandex uh, pants. There were no shoes or personal effects. Above her left breast was a tattoo with a blue cross with a superimposed red flower. On her abdomen was another tattoo of a flower. She had been right-handed with breast implants and might have had a hysterectomy but had never given birth or suffered a broken bone. The woman was about 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighed about 120 pounds, between 40 and 50 years old. She had been dead about three weeks when found. She had not been shot, stabbed, or strangled, but her system did contain more than enough cocaine to have killed her. In almost 30 years, it strikes me as odd that we know all of this information, but are still unable to uh, confirm the identity of the Norway, Illinois Jane Doe. Last but not least, the 1992 killing of Tammy Zawicki near Utica, reportedly last seen at mile marker 83 on I-80 in central Illinois between 3 and 4 p.m., on August 23rd, 1992. It was reported that a tractor trailer was seen near Zawicki's vehicle during this time period. The driver of the tractor trailer is described as a white male between 35 and 40 years of age, over six feet tall, with dark bushy hair. Some of the victim's personal property is known to be missing including a camera and musical wristwatch. That day, Tammy departed Evanston, Illinois for college in Grinnell, Iowa, where she was expected to arrive that evening. Later that day, Zawicki's car was found by an Illinois state trooper and ticketed as being abandoned. On 8-24-92, the vehicle was towed by the Illinois State Police. On that same evening, Zawicki's mother contacted the Illinois State Police and advised them that her daughter had not yet arrived at college. On 9-1-92, Zawicki's body was located along Interstate Highway 44, pronounced by the locals as, and I kid you not, Farty Far, in rural Lawrence County, Missouri which is located between Springfield and Joplin. Joplin's a big truck town in Missouri. She had been stabbed to death. The FBI and Illinois State Police believe new DNA testing technology will help reveal the killer's identity. And it is worth noting that Utica is not on the most direct route from Evanston to Grinnell, but a college student might have taken I-80 instead of 88 to avoid the tolls or the traffic, possibly. If you have information concerning this person, please contact the local office of your FBI. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to CapTech. I promise that not all of our topics are so serious or dark.